The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. Thanks for joining us for the fourth installment of GMS 3.4 Analysis Tools. Um, my name is Ray Tweston, and I'm the product manager here at Gatan for Analytical Products, and I welcome you to this webinar. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Liam Spillane. Uh, Dr. Spillane, when he's not out on the slopes uh, promoting eels, he's running around the rest of the world or virtually or in person uh, promoting eels, doing applications, the chief, chief application scientist at Catan. And he also is uh, one of, uh, has done a fair amount of programming within Catan, so he also uh, has helping us with the GMS uh, workflow and the overall structure of the system. So he will be taking over today for the presentation. Just a bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions about con connectivity or uh, data or, or image quality, sound quality, uh, please send that question in. We'll try to get to those right away. Uh, questions about the content, we'll hold to the end and we'll try to get to uh, those questions. If we can't get to them all at the end, we'll uh, follow up by email uh, so we get a record of all those questions. All right, without any further ado, I'll hand this over to Liam to take over the presentation. Thanks, Liam. Okay, thanks very much, Ray. And thanks to everyone for, for tuning in. So, uh, fourth webinar in the webinar series, multivariate statistical analysis. So, a brief overview of the presentation. So, I'm going to start off um, covering some multivariate statistical analysis fundamentals. Then I'll go over how we approach this in our software, so an overview of the new software tool. And then we'll move on to some application examples. So the first application example is going to be a live demo of the new tool. Actually, it's from a multi-layer bismuth ferrite device. We might look at the semiconductor device as well. And then I'm going to show you how to use external packages if you want to use something non-standard. So the package that I'm going to be using is this MCR LLM. Uh, package, which is a multivariate code that was written by Professor Brady and Goslin out of um, the University de Sherbrooke, which is in Canada. So multivariate analysis, what is it? The EOS spectrum imaging is well established as a powerful tool for materials analysis. A spectrum images typically contain many spectra and each spectrum contains many pixels. We can treat these statistically, so we can do statistical analysis methods for data analysis. So multivariate analysis methods are typically statistical analysis methods that involve taking um, an input matrix, which is the spectrum image, and then using two or more matrices that multiply to give an approximation of the input matrix. So this uh, formula here, we have X, which is the input matrix, C uh, is the component matrix, S is the scores matrix, and T denotes the transpose. So what does, what does that mean in, for our actual data? It's, it seems quite an abstract concept at the moment. So I'm gonna limit this to kind of a more hands-on description. So I'm not gonna go deep into the maths for PCA. But the scores matrix, um, so in the scores matrix, each row vector is a basis spectrum or what we call a loading. So that means the chemical phase is represented in the data component matrix, so the C matrix, each column vector is the cardinality or what we call the scores over ROI positions. So that's really telling us the spatial distribution of the identified chemical phases. So we have one matrix S, which tells us what we have, like the different components, and the other matrix C tells us kind of how those components are distributed around our sample. So let's look, kind of look at a real sample and kind of see what that actually really means. So I've got this example here, which is um, a tin oxide nanoparticle. So this is an output from a Verimax uh, plot, but we're gonna cover that later. But you can see that the top, the top uh, image here in this data set is the scores, and the, the, the lower one is the loading. So the loading is just kind of a, a spectrum, and the top is just the spatial distribution of that spectral component. So that's, that's really it. 
So what, what about principal component analysis in particular? So principal component analysis is a particular flavor of multivariate analysis. So principal component analysis computes a projection that maximizes the total variance in the projected data, it casts basis vectors and score images in order of, in order of significance. So the more significant spectral components come first, which is actually quite useful uh, in interpreting the data. The basis vectors are orthogonal. So this means that the spectral components are taken to be linearly independent, which is an important assumption. So typical applications, uh, data mining, phase identification, phase analysis, noise filtering, and data compression. So we can make it, we can draw a comparison to multiple linear least squares, which is it's kind of nice. So if we have our two matrices, so we have our scores matrix and our component matrix. So the scores matrix in PCA or MSA is equivalent to the reference models that we're using in multiple linear least squares fitting. The component matrix is equivalent to the scaling coefficients that we have in multiple linear least squares fitting. So how much of the phases and where they are. So PCA models the data as a linear combination of components, just like multiple linear least squares fitting. But there's a key difference. Unlike in MLLS, we don't choose the components in advance. So the, the PCA algorithm will just will choose the references that are st statistically significant for us in advance. So there's a number of packages that exist that are out there. So uh, Axia from Sandia, the MSA plugin for DM by Watanabe from HRE and Research, MSA plugin for Digital Micrograph that was written by the Lucas Group uh, from EPFL, Hyperspy, other Python packages. So some of these packages are free, some are not, and they have uh, various different functionality like weighted PCA, factor rotation, uh, denoising, et cetera. So I'm gonna focus on this, this plugin here. So MSA plugin for DM by the EPFL group. So C++ based, uh, you can do weighted PCA, factor rotation and independent component analysis. The reason I draw our attention to this is that this feature is part of the free offline license in GMS 3.4 and higher. So the, the code that we have uh, in our software is a one-to-one -one port from the academically accepted and published work by uh, Lucas Group. So we'd like to make a big thank you for those guys making the code available and allowing us to share it with everyone in the EM community. So what are the features of the tool? So we can do PCA. So we'll start off looking at the decomposition. So we have these three simple buttons or four simple buttons. We're gonna start on decompose. So if we run a PCA decomposition, we end up with a data set that has a score, the scores and the loadings, which we just covered earlier, and a scree plot. So I'll just cycle through some examples here. So here we're looking at different PCA components of this data set. So one, two, in order of significance. So you can see as we get to higher and higher components, then kind of the variance is decreasing and that's really helping us interpret the data. So if we look at this scree plot, the scree plot is actually a line plot of the component factors. And because they're in order of significance, it's super helpful for us to kind of make a decision between what's a real component and what's just noise. So if you look at the, the scree component, we typically, the scree plot, sorry, we typically look for this knee or inflection point, which uh, is kind of telling us where our real data ends and the noise begins. So everything that's higher, basically in this linear region, we take as noise. So that's really useful. Uh, you can see in this, this plot here, we have a hundred components, but it looks like only 10 are actual real components. So we can get rid of the kind of excess components so the 90 components that we think are noise. So that helps us because we're denoising. So that's the noise filtering aspect. 
we can also use it to compress the data. So we're reducing the size of the data set by a factor of 10, which is useful for processing, storage, etc. So one thing that is fairly clear when you look at these uh, PCA plots here, like the variance was high, but there are regions that are negative, regions that are positive. So we have this other feature, which is called Verimax. So Verimax uh, basically performs some factor rotation to ensure spectra are non-negative, which means that the, the results, the output, are more interpretable as component spectra. So one thing to always remember is just th these are kind of they're not net, not really real spectra. These are just these are statistically kind of strong components in the data. So it's always worth kind of looking at the actual real um, the spectrum image data just to verify that we have components that make sense. So kind of one final point: uh, PCA remember is based on linear combinations of spectra. And so that's really good for EDS. So in EDS, we have linear independence of, of our kind of peaks in the EDS spectrum. That's not always true for eels. So when we're doing PCA on eels data, we need to kind of be a bit more careful about how we do the processing. Okay, so that's a good point to jump to the software. So we're going to start off looking at this multi-layer sample. So it is. So I've actually already done the decomposition on this guy. So this is um, spectrum image of um, multi-layer. So the the region on the left is strontium titanate. So that's a substrate. Then we have a bismuth ferrite layer. Indium layer, and we have then the platinum, so the platinum coating. So it's a fib lamella. So if we wanted to run a decomposition here, we would basically hit this. We basically, okay, so I'll exit. So if I exit right out, so the MSA tool is in the data fit, uh, data fit technique, which is in the data analysis group of techniques. So I hit data fit, and then you've got your MSA analysis tool here. So all the options are available here because I already have run decomposition. So we could do a simple denoise, we can do decompose, we can do very max. To save a little time, I'm gonna look at the data set that has already uh, been decomposed. So this is a PCA decomposition of the spectrum image. So you can see straight away, I have three um, three pieces of data in the PCA decomposition. So the scores, the loadings, and the scree plot. So the way you navigate this data is you select the data set, and then we use the slice tool to kind of go through the components. So you can see the first component, second, third, fourth, fifth sixth and so on and then basically it's very clear with this data that the variance is high in these um components until about component uh, component four seems to be the last real component and then after that we have this kind of pure noise component from component five so if we keep going yeah you can see that it's pure poisson noise so this is a really well-behaved data set. So we can kind of look at the scores, we can look at the loadings, we can also look at the scree plot. So, so this is an example of a very easily interpreted scree plot. So this linear region is where we kind of we were expecting noise, and we have a super sharp gradient and really strong inflection point. So it's like it's very clear that that is where we want to start throwing away our data. So, so yeah, so if you want to, we can do Verimax, we can do denoise. So I actually already did a denoise. So this um, is denoised. I kept the four components. So there's the four components are pretty much the STO, the uh, bismuth ferrite, 
the iridium and the platinum. So if I use a spectrum picator, pull out a spectrum. So we have the denoid spectrum and I'm going to hold and drag that picker tool over to the original data. So the pixels are the same pixel, right? You can see the effect of the denoise. So it's very striking the effect of this denoise. We much, much clean, much, much cleaner data. So that's, uh, that's the first thing that we can do. Simple denoise. Then let's go and do a very max. So if you kind of, again, look at this guy, I'll sweep through the slices. Why has it gone away? Slice, okay. So remember that we have strong variance in these components. Well, the components that are real, but it's pretty hard to interpret what's going on. I mean, it's like, yeah, that's a component, but what, what am I really looking at? Loads of negative intensity. So we select the data set and then we go over back to the MSA analysis tool and we run Verimax. So choose the number of components to retain. We're going to perform the rotation in the spatial domain. And then I hit OK. OK, so let's put that data set there. OK, so now we have um, everything's positive, right? So if we do the same thing, if we sweep through, This, uh, this components here, they're much, much easier to interpret what's going on. So you can kind of see, oh, look, there's, there's some carbon, there's some oxygen. Um, iron, yeah, oxygen, and then there's some bismuth, like way up high energy. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a pretty nice way of kind of data mining your data set and doing the denoise. Okay, so that's that's an example of a sample that's pretty easy to work with. So this is counted data. This was from a K3 EOS system. So we have very good, um, kind of a very well-behaved detector. We have kind of ideal noise in the data. And we also have a well-behaved sample. So this is a, a fairly thin fib section. So it doesn't have any big changes in thickness. The plural scattering contributions are fairly uniform. So it's a combination of an, we have a good sample, but we also have a very good detector, so we're getting this benefit when we we doing the analysis. So what about if we had a data set that was a little bit more challenging? So I'm going to jump over to this semiconductor data set. So again, I've run the, the decomposition already, but uh, let's just run the decomposition again, because this is a smaller, smaller data set, so you can just see how, how it runs. So we just basically hit hit decompose, I have the spectrum image selected, and I'm going to press decompose again. Yes. Runs the decomposition, so that's that. Okay, so we end up with the same data, so we have score, loadings, and scree plot. So you can see straight away, um, with this data, we have a much, much less obvious point at where we can say, okay, it's noise or it's real data, because the gradient here is it's kind of a shallow change rather than a very abrupt uh, change in the gradient in the scree plot. Okay, so you might want to be a bit more conservative with this one. We could say, okay, let's uh, maybe denoise to 15 components. So if we were to select this data, simple denoise, and then let's denoise to 15. Yep, 15. Hit OK. Just the same thing. So we can do the same thing as we did before. So you can still see that 
you know, the top one here is the noise, uh, the normal data set. Bottom one is the denoise data set. So even with a fairly conservative denoise, kind of still winning, which is which is nice. So yeah, okay. So with this data, it's kind of more useful to kind of actually look a bit closer at what's going on in the data. So we use the slice tool again. You could say, oh, I just denoised to 15 components. Then maybe there's 15 components. But if you actually look at the data, so we again, we start from zero, look at the variance in this. Uh, basically, we want to look at the structure in the scores images, and you want to look at kind of the shapes of the of the loadings. So, okay, so strong variance, strong kind of structure in this guy, little scores. Okay, so five maybe. But then as we kind of go a little bit higher, we do have kind of strong variance, but it starts to, it doesn't look like actual real spectral components. So it could be non-linearity in, in the data. Maybe the thickness is changing. We've got some energy drift. Or maybe it's just to do with the detector, the detector behavior. So you can see it looks quite different from the K3 data. Okay, so let's do a very max with this one with five components. Okay. And then we end up with something, another very max, another factor rotation. Yeah, and then we end up with some nice, uh, some nice maps and some, we've basically got, yeah, five different kind of spectral signatures for the silicon LT3 edge in this sample. So we've got different layers, kind of these little precipitates. And that's what we end up mapping. So you can kind of see from this, from the, from the other example, you might think, oh, I could just, I don't even need to look at the components. I can just, from the screen plot, I can decide where to make my decision. But for something like this, that's a little bit more, um, less sharp, it's kind of, it's important to do the decomposition, actually look at the scores and the loadings before deciding where to do your variamax rotation or your denoise, for example. So kind of one final thing that I want to show you with this is that if I close everything, so if I select my original data, I've just thrown out the all the decomposition. So it's actually possible to run a simple denoise just as a one-click option. So if we do a simple denoise, it will do the decomposition. And then you can then say, okay, I want to denoise to 15 again. We'll do the same thing. So that's that's really nice. That's a very quick and easy way to do the simple, do, do a denoise. But bear in mind, when you just do the simple denoise without the decomposition, it's not keeping the decomposition. So if you're confident in the in in the point in, in the data that you want to kind of throw away components. Simple denoise is nice because it's faster, but if you kind of want to dig a little deeper into the data, it's worth doing the decomposition first because then you can actually look at the scores, you can look at the loadings, and then you can denoise after anyway. So you have the two options, the two options there. Okay, so pretty much covered that. So let's go back to the webinar. Okay, so there were actually two, two examples there instead of one. Okay, so I uh, compiled the results from the K3 data onto the slide to make it a little nicer to present. So that data was actually taken on a Techni F20 in Pleasanton. So it was done at 200 kV, 0.9 EV per channel dispersion, and each pixel was five milliseconds. So we did a PCA decomposition and a four component Varimax. So this is a color mix of the four components. So uh, green is the bismuth ferrite um, component. Oops, no, it's not strontium titanate. Green is strontium titanate. Blue is bismuth ferrite. 
and red is iridium and yellow is platinum so you can have the scores overlaid and make a nice uh, nice color mix and then you can also pull out the loadings and make like a waterfall plot or whatever so it's a nice way of presenting the data so now let's, let's kind of go into some practical aspects so it was kind of started to become clear when we looked at the software live that you need to take care interpreting the scree plot so this is the same scree plot uh, that we just saw from the K3 data. So when there's a sharp knee or inflection, it's really easy to ID the last kind of major real component. But if it's shallow change or there are multiple inflections, it's a bit more difficult and therefore easier to miss real data. So this is kind of an easy case on the left, the K3. Uh, this is kind of like, let's say, medium case. So this is more challenging, but it's still not uh, unreasonable but then we're going to now look at something that is much more difficult so we have an example of a quite poor quality uh, multi-signal spectrum image so we were doing EDS and EELS here and we found that the uh, there's a particularly there's like low signal to noise ratio in these maps or some of them but particularly the titanium elemental map so you could think I'll, I'll just run PCA and I'll make my data, make my data better. So we ran a PCA decomposition and you can see the scree plot here is quite different to the other two. So this doesn't even really, it's very much uh, shallower kind of changing gradient here. It's a kind of looks like it might be linear at 50 components. And you could think, well, normally I throw out everything over four, five, ten components. And we can also we look at these elemental maps and we think, well, I've got however many components, eight, uh, no, seven. So we've got seven components. So we might think actually 50, 50 denoise with this data is very conservative because we've only got seven, seven actual spectral components, so it's fairly safe. But with this data, it actually made the mapping worse. So if we look at the titanium, we don't have any titanium and real, real titanium information in our map anymore. Um, oxygen, nitrogen have changed, and nickel, basically every single map here has changed. So we've kind of naively thought that we would make, the, make our maps better, but we've kind of, we've thrown out a load of information and then created artifacts in the other maps. So you have to treat the data with some sense and kind of, you know, make sure the data is good enough to decompose in the first place. It's not basically a magic bullet that will make bad data into good data. So what else? Um, I guess this touches on what I just said. So it can help to pre-process the data to minimize the potential for artifacts. So it's always worth removing X-ray spikes. There's a a simple one-click function in the volume tools menu so always remove x-ray spikes before running uh, msa decomposition consider deconvolution if the specimen has large change in relative thickness and then you can also rebin the data if it's very noisy to improve the signal to noise ratio so that's also possible through the volume tools menu one other thing, the MSA tool is really good as a precursor for other automated analysis. So it's a compiled plugin, it's written in C++. So it runs at relatively high speed on fairly large arrays. It also has uh, nice visualization tools as you've just seen. So it can be a very fast way of kind of pre-screening your data, identifying how many components there are. And then you can then you know, basically help yourself out if you're running other automated analysis that's slower, uh, where you have to enter the number of components that you have. So what about other methods? So yeah, the big advantage of our tool is that it's an embedded tool in GMS. So it will run natively on any spectrum image data object you have in the software. You don't need to import, export, or do anything funky with the data to be able to do your MSA, your P PCA decomposition. But there's lots of other multivariate analysis methods and packages that are already published. 
So you might want to do something like non-negative matrix factorization, NMF, multivariate curve resolution. You might even want to use a different PCA algorithm. And then multivariate analysis is a rapidly expanding field. So this is likely to keep changing. And, you know, there's going to be new tools, new packages published. So if you want to use them, how would you do that? So that's kind of a nice segue into Python. So GMS has always had its own scripting language, which we call DM scripting. So you can make user written routines from simple macros to large full scale applications. It has a custom syntax built on C++ and you can do object oriented programming. Python is the fourth most popular programming language and it's being increasingly used as probably many people know for scientific computing. So there's loads of really great libraries like NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib. You can do machine learning, deep learning using scikit-learn, TensorFlow. We can perform spectral analysis in something like HyperSpy. So Python can be embedded in applications as a scripting language, uh, which we've gone ahead and done in GMS 3.4. So GMS 3.4 now includes Python as a scripting language. So we have some resources available on our website. So there's a Python specific webinar uh, that Ben Miller gave a few weeks ago, and there's a recording of that webinar on the media library. So the link to the media library is there. We also have two Python specific kind of short tutorial videos and um, kind of telling you how to get set up and how to install external packages. So if anyone's interested in getting up and running uh, with Python scripting and hasn't seen that content, I'd recommend checking it out. So that's kind of a nice segue into example two. So this uh, is multivariate curve resolution by log likelihood maximization or MCR LLM, which is much easier to say. So some background. So multivariate curve resolution or MCR is similar to non-negative matrix factorization, but with some additional physical, physically meaningful constraints beyond just non-negativity. So MCR alternating least squares, so MCR ALS, has been used successfully for TM data, but it's often fails or gives funky results for low signal to noise ratio data. So Professor Brady and Goslin, uh, Professor Goslin, have used a Poisson-like, Poisson log likelihood, so LLM optimization step to replace ALS for abundance optimization, which they found really improved MCR performance for low count and low signal to noise ratio data. So if anyone's particularly interested in the background and the theory in this method, I refer you to the paper. So the full details are in this 2019 reference and uh, Nature Scientific Reports, which is at the bottom of the slide. I'm really just using this as an example to show how you can do something kind of non-standard in digital micrograph. So their code, their MCR LLM code is available from pypy.org. So that's a link to code. And what's really great with this package and many Python packages is it's super easy to do the installation. So you just run your Python environment from a command line and you just have a one line installation. So it's pip install package name, which is in this case, MCR LLM. Okay, so let's move on to some of the results. So they have basically acquired a some spectrum image data from an Intel Ivy Bridge sample. So it's a semiconductor, a gate. So they used uh, Titan, so they're running at 300 kV. And they acquired the data on a GIF quantum ERS. So uh, convergence angle of 80 milliradians, collection of 40 milliradians, and they were running at 0.5 EV per channel dispersion. So this is the survey image, and you can see they basically acquired a line profile. So the survey image region is denoted by this yellow line. Okay, so here we have the MCR LLM results. 
So at the top here, we just basically have the line integral of the HADAF intensity. So this is actually experimental data, the black line here. But these plots here, so this one and this one is the data that's come out of the code. So the code's pulled out these uh, different spectral components. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven components. And then the other line plot here is how those components are distributed along this line. So it's kind of like intensity profiles of these spectral components, the colors, the colors match up. Okay, so this is a good point to jump to the other demo. So MCR live demo. Okay, so you see two two things that are open here. I have one that's called data eels uh, one. So that's that's the line profile data. So this is the spectrum image data set. And then we have this uh, script. So the way that the Python scripting works in GMS now is basically exactly the same as what we're used to if anyone did Python so, or regular DM scripting, you just have this checkbox or kind of combo choice at the bottom where you can choose the language. So you can choose Python, you can choose DM script. So it's a Python script, I leave it as Python. But what's kind of obvious here, this is a really short script. So I just installed their package and this, we just need to pull in the data, run their function, and then export the data. So I'm going to execute my script. So I've added a line that asks how many components. Press seven, because there's seven components. Wait a little while. Okay. So it's just done MCR LLM on this data set and pulled out seven components and 20 iterations. So I haven't written any code in here to convert this to EELS data. So I'm just going to do that manually because it's easier. Spectrum convert data to EELS just for display. So that allows me to use the picker tool. So now if I use a picker tool on this guy. So we can do, so these are the loadings. So the different spectral signatures that we have in that data. And there are seven, well, there's seven because I chose seven. And then this isn't actually EELS data. So what I've done here is a little obscure, but it just allows me to use the picker tool, which is an easy way to kind of look at the lines. So I'm just going to do it anyway. So the scores is, uh, yeah, just kind of how much of what we have and where. So the indexes here, the indices match up. So this is component zero, and this is component zero. So you can see that runs really fast. It's really easy. Um, I didn't have to leave GMS to do that. It's and then if we look at the script, it's not very complicated script. So it doesn't have, you know, 37 lines of code, including quite a lot of line breaks and comments. We could do stuff that's more fancy, like move the metadata and various things like that. But to do something that's just some easy processing, you don't have to write a whole lot of, of code. So let's go back to the demo. So yeah, I will just now, yeah, compare the results. So here's the results from their paper, which we saw on the previous slide. So, and then I presented the GMS kind of output in the same way as, as the results in the paper. So I've matched the colors up. Um, so you can kind of, you know, look at the two and see that they're the same. So yeah, it's pretty nice. Some practical aspects if we want to do this kind of this kind of thing. So the workflow is pretty much you need to install the Python packages. So you'll you'll probably want to work with one particular Python package. 
So you need to install that package and any of the prerequisites that that package needs. So maybe you might need matplotlib or numpy or, or whatever. So then the first thing that we always do is convert the spectrum image data to a numpy array. That's just a single line of code. Transpose and or reshape the array perform the multivariate analysis, transpose and or reshape the output, and then visualize the results in GMS. So there's really not that many steps and the bulk of this is kind of reusable for different code packages. So I've used, I've done this with a few different external packages and the steps are pretty much the same. The main bulk of the work I found is to, you just need to take care with the array transpose. You need to be careful with the array transposition and reshape because the external code, so the external MSA code is going to want the data in a certain shape and orientation. So you have to be careful to get that right, but otherwise it's, it's fairly straightforward. There's some code testing tips. So anyone that has done a lot of coding, this will probably be well known, but for people that are kind of just starting out, beginners or kind of, yeah. So stuff that I've picked up along the way. So read and plan. So avoid writing code before planning how the program will run. So if you basically do some planning, it will help you out a lot in the long run. Um, work with small array sizes so this will reduce run time so you find errors faster you can just do this by rebinning to a smaller data object size using the volume tools in gms and then work uh, test with asymmetric arrays so transposition and reshaping errors are much easier to find when x doesn't equal y doesn't equal z and finally you have a really kind of powerful visualization tool that you're running. So use GMS as a visualization tool and just output the arrays, the NumPy arrays, the DM data kind of at particular, you know, you can put the test points in the code and you can just throw the array out, see what it looks like. And sometimes when you look at the array, you can say, oh, it's much easier to see where it's wrong if, it, if it's wrong. Okay, so summary. So multivariate statistical analysis tool. So we can do PCA and factor rotation within GMS. It's a one-to-one -one port of academically and accepted and published work. So it's published by Lucas et al, 2013. Typical applications for the tool will be data mining of unknowns, denoising, data compression, and it's a really good precursor to other automated analysis or other kind of more cumbersome multivariate analysis code. So then embedded Python. So there's a lot of other MSA methods that have been published and available and Python really unlocks kind of access to those methods. So it's very simple and fast to install external Python packages. And it's also simple and fast to use them. So we have a bunch of other stuff that we can use. Plus this is all part of the free license. So you can get the software for free at katan.com and you can have the multivariate tool and the Python, embedded Python, a part of that free license. So that's, that's all. So if anyone has any questions, now would be, that would be the time. Great, thank you so much, Liam. That was very informative. Uh, those worked examples were really nice. Um, we did have uh, some questions come in uh, during the webinar. Actually, one of them I, I can address straight away. The question about licensing. Um, so yeah, we, the free license is available on the website. If you just go to our gatan.com website, look under software in the support section. But if you already own a license for GMS3, you can add on the functions of the free licenses together with your paid license. So the two can be combined together without deinstalling one or reinstalling the other. So if you have, say, licenses for tomography, you can then add in spectrum imaging through the free licenses and, and, and keep, all, keep all of the, all the things together. So we did a question about the MCR, which I was kind of curious as well. How did you know there were seven components? I mean, yeah, you read the paper, but um, 
was there a way to get at that information with, without just doing trial and error? Um, yeah, I didn't do, I didn't do, didn't do that. But the, if I probably didn't know in advance that there were seven components, that would be a very good example of where to use the MSA tool. So you could throw that data into the MSA tool, look at the scores, look at the loadings and look at the screen plot. Otherwise you'd need to use the picker tool on the, on the original data set, but the MSA tool would be a faster way of kind of looking at the data in my opinion. Especially one of those components is very small. So I think if you just looked at the raw data, it would be easy to see, it'd be easy to see the silicon, the silicon oxide, the hafnia, the tantalum and the tungsten and the tungsten. But you might miss this nitrite, this one, uh, because that's, that little bump there is quite small. So you might, unless you looked carefully at the raw data, you might think that there were six components, not seven. So I would say using the MSA tool would probably be beneficial. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that makes sense for me. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah PCA is good at determining the number of components. Mm -hmm. And this, this analysis was for one dimensional data that you, you can also do two-dimensional data using the... Yeah, the, yeah, so I have two different scripts. So I have one script that works on line profile data and another script that works on uh, two-dimensional arrays, so a 3D, a 3D data cube instead of a 2D uh, object. So I just chose to present the, the line profile data because it was nice to compare the, the work of the paper with with kind of you know what we can do in, in the software because we had the we want to see that the results are the same but it's not limited to line profile data you can use it on higher dimensional data so then you just have to unwrap it differently yeah then... pretty much so the um the uh, where's the script oh it's in the, it's in the software isn't it <laughs> so it's just this step here so you've got, um, can you, is that font big enough? It is now for sure. Yeah, so you've got this step. Uh, actually, the line profile data doesn't really need any, um, any work. Let's see if I've got it. Uh, seven. So if anyone wants to see this code. So the line profile is in the right shape by in, it's intrinsically the right shape, whereas the 3D, so the 3D object requires, it just, I mean, it's not a lot of code. It requires just, um, so the way this code works is it takes line profile data. So what you have to do with a 3D object, you basically, you have to do a transposition and then you reshape the transposed array into a line profile. So it just makes a much, much bigger line profile for the input for this uh, MCR code. And then at the end, then you have to reshape the, the result into something. So it's just essentially three lines of code. You do this transposition here, uh, reshape, and then the, the MCR does its stuff. I mean, a lot of the code here is just save. I actually have some extra stuff here to save the NumPy array to an external file, but the actual MCR part is really just um, this line here. So there's a single right. function. Yeah, so it's this function, right? You've got a function called MCR LLM that you call on uh, an array and you've got some parameters. So number of iterations or number of components. Yeah, basically it's an array, a number of components, a number of iterations. And that's it. So you just have to put something into this that's the right shape. Then you get your C and S matrices out. And then you reshape the C matrix so that it looks correct in digital micrograph. But you don't need to do anything with the S matrix. The S matrix is the right shape. So it's just that's really the main thing that you have to do. It's just getting getting the data in the right f form for the whatever code you want to use and just don't assume that it will be 
the same. It, you do it once. It, it, the steps are the same, but the actual the implementation is usually slightly different. So it's worth it's worth just checking checking that, and it saves you a lot of time. Yeah, I don't know. I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. Okay. Yeah, I guess I I kind of I kind of sent you off there. Um, so actually, a question from from me is the the so I'm kind of new to the uh, Python scripting. The, the um there's a in our help file we have examples of Python scripting and different ideas Oops. like this. I think there is one version with um, the using a negative, uh, uh, non-negative matrix factorization. That is pattern. correct. So yeah. there's a Python scripting um, section. Right. And then if you look in the examples, one of them is NMF. So you've got that. I'm not sure I can zoom in to that very much or at all. Okay, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's there. Uh, yeah, so I mean, you've, you've, you've got, got yeah, yeah, to get started so, on this stuff. Yeah, exactly. So there's an, there's an NMF example here using the scikit-learn package. Okay. Um, so you just need to say, so, yeah, you need to install sklearn and scipy. So that, this, and the NMF in scikit-learn works really nicely with EDS data. Um, yeah, that works pretty well. I have some other package that works better with eels. That, so if anyone is interested, just reach out. And it's a, it's a package called MalSpy that seems to give nice results. And it was published by a Shiga group in, you know, Japan, I think. But their code has some more kind of uh, exotic sort of constraints that you can put on the NMF that seem to work better for eels than just the standard algorithm. But yeah, this is a nice example. And uh, there's also an example like a hybrid script. So you can actually um you can embed the python code in the dm script code so that's kind of cool so you can call the python script from within the dm script uh which is so that example if anyone's interested in it's probably worth working on this one first just the nmf decomposition and then look at the the second one which is a hybrid of dm script and python script wherever i just put that somewhere in there that one <laughs> Example three. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, we're, we're a couple of minutes over already. Um, so uh, uh, maybe we should just leave it there. Um, I do just take a moment just to thank you, Liam, for, for the great presentation. Uh, thank the group at EPFL, Cecilia Hebert and, and her team there uh, for uh, sharing the, the code base for the uh, PCA and uh, Natty Brady and his group there at uh, Sherbrooke uh, for uh, helping us out with the, uh, the multivariate curve resolution. Um, and uh, I, I guess our, the next webinar is not in the same series, uh, but it's on uh, 23rd of June, and it'll be the group at the uh, Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies at Los Alamos Lab and Sandia Labs, uh, talking about into analysis and high-speed data so that should be very exciting. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody for joining and tuning in. If you have any questions, uh, uh, keep them coming. Uh, we'll we'll try to get to those uh, questions offline. And uh, appreciate your uh, uh, attendance. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ray. Awesome.